Hi everyone. Welcome to this interview with Hassel Aviles from Not Nine to Five. I'm going to read a little description about Hassel's journey and the organization. Hassel and her co-founder Aria Coughlin established this charity to provide training and support to hospitality professionals in the areas of mental health and substance use. They recognize that the industry draws people who face challenges in these areas, but that there is more stigma than healing conversations. Thank you very much for being here, Hassel. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, I always start by setting a context for the interview, and this is to set a conversation around work-life balance, which we don't do enough of in the industry because it affects all areas of our lives. Um, I sort of see it as the elephant in the room, something everyone wants to talk about, but we don't get there. Um, as an employee, you might expect that the responsibility falls in the employer to set the right rotas to give you enough time off. And as an employer, you might wonder whether it weakens the work ethic, uh, and, but you're pr you're, you pay price when your staff show up to work with challenges in their personal life. And then on the other hand, there's a culture which encourages martyrdom, self-sacrifice, and we don't have this blueprint of how to deal with this challenge, and which is why I wanted to invite you to get your insights and wisdom on the topic. Um, I want to ask you by asking the first question about sharing your journey with 95 and how you set up this organization and where it's headed. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Um, so to start, I would say that a lot of what you just shared is part of my story too, you know, um, growing up in the industry, I was 17 when I started at my first job, I was a host and I came in completely blind as to the kind of industry I was entering. Um, I didn't really know that much about the industry other than, you know, what you see on TV and what you experience as a consumer eating out. Um, which frankly doesn't really show the truth at all. <laughs> um, and so when I started as a host and quickly became a server, you know, after some short time, got experienced in bartending and just like kind of moved my way through different front of house roles. Um, I, I, I felt like, so it's interesting that you say the elephant in the room from your perspective is this like lack of work life balance. Um, for me, I felt that the elephant in the room was mental health and substance use challenges. Mm -hmm. So I felt that at every restaurant, every bar, every hotel, cafe, like any kind of hospitality environment that I worked in had a very high level of mental health and substance use challenges um, all around me, but that nobody was talking about them. And instead, there was a lot of obviously consumption of substances um, and a lot of suffering, but yet no conversation or access to resources or support. And simultaneously with entering the industry and working in the industry, I also experienced a lot of mental health challenges. Um, and he was even diagnosed with mental illness uh, in my early 20s. Um, depression and anxiety were two of my biggest struggles, still are. And um, intermixed in that was also, you know, so many things that happened in life around grief, you know, losing people and trauma and other things that really impact the human experience, but also obviously your work as well. And so I had to really figure out um, my way around all of these massive, huge topics uh, without very much access to resources or help and a really high level of shame and stigma. And so I got to fast forward, you know, till about, it was late 2017 or so. Uh, sorry, yeah, late 2017, Ariel had hosted uh, a panel at his restaurant and he invited me to be one of the panelists. And there was a couple of us there kind of sharing our own experiences. Um, and I had done a lot of open dialogue with people that were close to me up until that point, like close friends or coworkers that I was like working side by side with. I was pretty open about depression, anxiety, therapy, um, you know, mental health challenges, substance use, and all these different things. Um, even though my bosses weren't, and even though the environments I was operating weren't, I was as an individual. 
But that panel was one of the first times that I really was open with strangers, like people that I didn't know. And I just kind of put it all out there. And there was other people on the panel that were also equally like meeting me where I was at. Like, so all of us were being very vulnerable and sharing a lot. And that eventually led to Arl and I kind of growing it into something more. Um, at the end of that night, I, I remember saying to him, like, I don't know what your plan is with this conversation, but I need to keep doing this. Uh, it's, it, I loved it. And I, I, ga I gained so much validation from being in a room of other people that were all basically just saying, you know, me too. And, and then sharing their experiences. Um, so in the last two and a half years, it's turned and it went from being, you know, a conversation <laughs> to a nonprofit organization. So today, Not 9 to 5 is a nonprofit organization incorporated here in Canada. And we have, you know, grown it into much more than a conversation. So obviously, initially, the goal, the mission, the priority was increasing awareness and decreasing stigma. But very quickly, we moved past, we well, got moved past, sorry, very quickly, we added on to that. So that will always be the base of it. You know, anytime that we go into anywhere is awareness and and openness is a huge priority um because listen as much as i'm open about my mental health experiences i acknowledge that not everyone else is so when i'm vulnerable i find that i'm equally met with vulnerability from others um there's a lot to say about vulnerability being contagious that when you open yourself up it really gives permission for others to do the same so um but beyond that, we've now moved into creating industry specific resources. We built a course last year that we put out online. And for the last two years, we've held a number, like dozens of workshops and online seminars, virtual events, um, tons of panels, tons of seminars, tons of, you know, um, ways to bring the community together to get like further, I guess, comfortable and educated on a lot of mental health, specifically workplace mental health, um, you know, uh, resources and support, because in other industries, it's quite common to address these issues very openly with support for staff and for teams. And unfortunately, in our industry, we just haven't really caught up. So I would say what's, you know, in the future for Not 9 to 5 is we continue to get federal funding here in Canada, which is very exciting. Last year, we were funded by the Canadian Red Cross. This year, we have another funder that's actually a much larger amount than um, we've ever had before. So I'm really excited, but um, it's not going to be announced until later this year. So I can't say who it is or, or what it is specifically, but I can say that Not 9 to 5 has a very bright future ahead of it. Uh, ahead of us. And in 2021, we will be further expanding educational courses online, offering industry specific resources, continuing on to launch series of virtual events and webinars for people to join. And what was the last piece? Um, Oh, and, and then just, yeah, creating more around specific workplace training for these topics. Um, because I find that, you know, especially for small to medium sized businesses, um, they often don't have an HR department, let alone a HR person, right? There's, there's no department. And sometimes there's one person, but it happens to be the boss <laughs> or it happens to be, you know, like a bartender who is also kind of helping out with HR. So why, why we create a lot of these online specific industry specific resources is so that small to medium businesses can equip themselves with, you know, adequate um, support in training on these topics and, and be able to give their staff mental health and substance use support skills. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. It's such a great service to those businesses who understand because I think that's the same case here. It's, it's somebody from the house maybe who works in HR, well, uh, works as the HR person and I can totally relate to how it must be for the staff to not have someone to approach when there's something very sensitive to discuss is Mental health. Um, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome.
how would you define a good work-life balance and what was it like trying to strike a balance between work and personal life during your many roles right from front of house to management and then working very closely with food entrepreneurs as well? Yeah, I, I mean, I find, I, I'm not going to lie, I find the, the term work-life balance to be such a tricky one um, because I just don't know that it's something that has a definition that we all agree on. Do you know what I mean by that? So, so it becomes like a subjective term. So your definition of work-life balance might be completely different than my definition of work-life balance might be different than, you know, our teammates, our employers. And so that's a tricky one for me to answer. And I would just, I preface it with just this, that this is just my personal experience and take. And in no way am I suggesting that this is what works for others. You know, I think the, I, the whole idea and concept of work-life balance is something that really needs to be personalized. Um, so I think that's the first thing I would say. I think it depends what role you play, how many roles you play. You know, so for me, for example, I have, I run a nonprofit organization, but I also have a full-time job and I'm also a single parent of two kids. And I'm also, you know, um, someone who has a, a many, many other things in my life that are important to me, right? Like my social connections and my family and, you know, a ton of other things that I prioritize for my mental and physical health. Um, and so for me, what I'm trying to do now is based on years of not doing well. <laughs> If that makes sense, you know, so in the past, like in my various roles as a server, as a bartender, or, you know, when I worked in events, event life was very similar to this industry, although it's one aspect of this industry that I find often gets missed. It's a crucial one. So anyone that works in events specific to the culinary industry, um, it's, it's the same. It's still affected by the brigade system. It's still like people working with food that have disordered eating habits. It's still, you know, long stretches of work without breaks. It's still not enough time off. You know, it, it, it has so many of the similarities that I saw in restaurants um, working in events. And so I think, you know, back then I burnt out a lot because of all those things I just mentioned. I, I wasn't taking a, enough breaks, even though they were legal breaks to take, <laughs> I still didn't take them. And I worked in, in, in environments where it wasn't encouraged to take breaks. So, you know, that's also illegal and problematic, but it happens a lot. Um, definitely did not eat enough. So I would go like 10 hours, you know, on like a muffin. And, you know, or, and, and barely some water and coffee, a lot of coffee, um, you know, so a lot of disordered eating bad habits I had, um, I would supplement my system with a ton of substances. Um, I definitely didn't sleep enough. And I, you know, uh, also was really overwhelmed with my own mental health experience. You know, so I wasn't prioritizing my mental health back then. I was just kind of in survival mode, you know. Um, but I will say the last restaurant job I did, I worked there for two years and it was the best restaurant I ever worked in because there actually was these things in place. So we did eat. We did have to take breaks. We, you know, it was discouraged if you didn't like it was in, it, you were encouraged to do these things for yourself. There was a team environment um, there was adequate training and support for people. Um, there was, of course there were substances. Cause listen, if you work in hospitality, one of the most important products that's usually sold is a substance it's alcohol. Right. And so obviously that was around, but we treated it differently. Like there was like wine courses with sommeliers where you would learn about the product and it wasn't just about chugging it and, you know, you know, just consuming for the sake of consuming. There was like actual education and training built around it, which I found like very, very helpful because then that way you're having a different relationship with the substance, right? I often say, the problem isn't the substance. The problem isn't the object. The problem is your relationship 
with that substance, right? Like alcohol is not going anywhere. And if anything, we're actually adding more substances. So here in Canada, like cannabis is legal now, right? So we're actually adding substances to the menu, not taking them away. So I think it's really important to address the relationship with the substances. And, and so I think, you know, back to your question of work-life balance, I think it's also about your relationship with that term and how you define it. So when I was a bartender, obviously my work-life balance looked really different because my schedule was totally different and my lifestyle was totally different. Um, these days, you know, now I'm a mom and I run a nonprofit and I, you know, also have another job. And so I think for me, my work-life balance looks really different now based on my lifestyle today and, you know, my work today and the priorities in my life today. Um, so I would say for me, I kind of see work the same as I said, I see as the same way I explained to you how I see substances. So I don't see work as the problem. I see my relationship with the work as something that's important to explore. And so in the same way that like, for example, I put into my calendar today, like to come and do this interview with you, or I put into my calendar, you know, other work meetings that I have to do, presentations, panel discussions, you know, whatever other work I'm doing. I also put into my calendar other things that are important for my life. So things that spark joy, you know, um, exercise, uh, so social like activities where I have like a connection with people, whether that's just a friendly walk together or going on a hike with someone or, you know, time with my kids. Um, so the way I manage it is I, I really try to treat it with the same level of importance and priority. So if my work stuff goes in my calendar, then my life stuff goes in my calendar, right? If my work stuff um, is a non-negotiable in terms of like, me showing up today, like I, if I have a commitment, then I, I have to honor it. So the same goes for my life. If I make a commitment to myself, I have to honor it. And I can't treat it as like, oh, I don't feel like working out today, you know, or, oh, I'm just going to blow off my friend and flake and cancel. Or, you know, I'm, I don't feel like doing therapy because I just want to watch Netflix instead. Like I, I, I can't allow myself to do that anymore because that's when the balance, the quote unquote balance, I mean, I find balance is never really a thing, but that's when like, it really goes to extreme levels. So instead of feeling like more stable, I feel completely unstable if those kinds of things don't get prioritized. And the last piece I'll say to your question is that, and this is just my personal experience, but I've also heard it a lot with other people that struggle with mental health and substance use challenges is that all of these things around work and life and trying to balance all of the things, it just, it, it really has to be kind of taken seriously in the sense of if you have, for example, like a physical illness or you have, so you have a challenge with your physical health, Oftentimes society and people take that more seriously, you know? So if you're like diagnosed with diabetes, for example, they'll be like, oh my gosh, of course you need to take insulin. Of course you need to go to the doctor and take care of it. Of course you need to change your diet, you know? But then for some reason, I find sometimes when you're diagnosed with like depression, for example, or anxiety, the same level of importance isn't put on those things. And I... I think that the way I see all this work-life balance stuff that I was describing to you with like my calendar and like all the different priorities, I have to see it. I have to take it so seriously and I have to make those commitments because to me, it's no different than like a physical illness, right? To me, a mental illness is just as serious as a physical illness. Just like my mental health is just as important as my physical health. Um, it's all interconnected, right? It's all health at the end of the day. And and I think for too long in our society, we haven't explored that properly. And we've put mental health kind of aside and been like, no, physical health is very important, but it's like our brain is in our bodies. So why would mental health not be, you know, prioritized in the same way? 
Um, so for me, that was the last thing I wanted to share on the work-life balance thing is that it's not, for me personally, it's not about work-life balance. It's about taking care of my physical and mental health and my relationship with work in my life is part of that for sure, but that it's, it's a life or death situation. That's how I see it. Thank you. Thank you for sharing so many valuable points. And I think maybe this is the only benefit of the work life balance being so fluid because through everyone's experience, we learn to look at our lives as well. And that's really valuable. Thank you. Um, how would you see, I think you've spoken to this already. How would you see work life balance affecting hospitality, particularly from the context of your work? If there's anything else you would like to add and the challenges faced by your community? at this particular moment? Yes. I mean, in specific to hospitality industry, there is a couple of things I would like to add um, that are specific to hospitality and culinary. Um, the biggest thing is the impact of the brigade system on our industry. So if anyone's listening and they don't really understand what I mean by that, um, some contextual history that's important to know about hospitality and culinary and kitchens um, is the influence of the brigade system on our entire industry and the work environments that are created within it and the chef culture that has also obviously now become quite mainstream. Um, you know, you watch shows with those chefs like Gordon Ramsay and you're horrified, but I don't know about I don't know about you, Ishu, but for me, like when I watch those, I'm not horrified because that was what I grew up with, you know? Um, so that was normal. Like I worked in bars and restaurants where there were, my boss was like that, you know? And it wasn't TV. It was just a regular Wednesday evening. Um, so, you know, uh, I think that for a long time, the hierarchy, so the brigade system basically is a hierarchy, right? So in the same way that in the military, you have a brigade system that's military influence in kitchens, you have the brigade de cuisine, but it's the same thing. You have someone at the top who dictates what everyone else below, it's a chain of command, right? And it's not about what do you think we should do issue? It's like, I am above you. So I tell you when to, you know, when to look left, when to look right, when to breathe, when to go to the bathroom, when, like what recipe to use, what ingredients go in it. And like you question nothing. And so that system has severely influenced our industry. Unfortunately, it's how many kitchens were built in still to this day. Right. Um, and so someone might be listening to this and be like, okay, maybe back then French restaurants were structured that way. What does that have to do with work life balance, you know, today? Well, everything would be my answer because it sets the tone for the whole culture and workplace. And what the brigade system prevents is um, the ability for ideas for process, for, um, you know, any decision that needs to be made, it doesn't swim upstream. It only comes downstream. And so what happens is you end up with an industry that's kind of stuck because there's not enough conversations creating innovation or creativity or vulnerability. And you're creating basically like what I've now come to learn in the last two years after like so many different surveys that we put out and research and data and conversations is that our industry lacks psychological safety. Mm -hmm. And that is to me a huge part of why um, we find ourselves where we are today. And as the brigade system starts to become archaic, which it is already started to become that way, it's already moving in that direction. Thank goodness. Mm -hmm. um, psychological safety is slowly starting to seep in. And so again, if someone's listening and is like, what is psychological safety? Um, the simplest definition that I can give them is it's the, uh, it's an environment where people feel that they can take risks, make mistakes and be vulnerable with one another without any um, fear of negative consequences to how they're perceived or their job. 
So if I work in a kitchen and I'm having a hard time in my life and I go to my chef or I go to my sous chef or whoever I work with and I, or my manager, and I tell them, Hey, I'm having a really hard time, you know, in my life right now. And I possibly need a workplace accommodation. So like maybe now on Thursdays, I can't be scheduled on Thursdays because I want to go to therapy on Thursdays, or this is, this is a hypothetical example. But if you work in an environment that's like a brigade system where you're not really encouraged to be vulnerable with one another, and you're told to like, check that at the door, you know, like check your, I can't tell you how many times I was told to check my emotions at the door and to not, you know, be able to share an emotional experience um, and ask for help then what happens is that a lot of harm is caused from that. And that person is now being discouraged, right? To get help. That person is being shamed for being human and having a human experience. <laughs> and, and then that, that question that you asked about, like, what does work-life balance, how does that show up in hospitality? And like, what does this all have to do with it? Well, it's completely interconnected because now if I'm struggling and you're telling me that, you know, we don't talk about that or, or you shame me and make me feel embarrassed or judged for wanting to go to therapy or having some sort of mental health challenge, then I now will not really balance that into my life. And I will now be prioritizing my work over my life. And then I will continue to suffer in silence and struggle on my own and that work environment in hospitality is now actually impacting my mental and physical health right so that's how that's all interconnected right and so if you are talking about work-life balance with chefs and if you're trying to move this conversation into actual practice that's what that looks like Thank you, thank you. There's something that you said at the start of how it, the chef pet culture, the brigade system, sets a tone for the whole, for the rest of the industry. And it just makes me think this is probably something I want to research about how it changes the perception of front of house teams or any other teams that make up the industry. Just this culture dominating the conversation and what the industry looks like from the outside. So it's, thank you, thanks for that point. Um, and one piece of advice that you have for chefs who would like to improve the quality of their lives. Anything so oh, Only one? <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. It's, it's, I, okay. If I had to pick one, I mean, I have like hundreds I could give you, but if I had to pick one, I would say to the chef that they put themselves at the top of their lists. Because I know that every chef makes lists, right? You're, you're famous for making lists. All my pastry chef or just chefs, executive chefs, all of my chef friends are obsessed with their lists. And, you know, whether it's inventory list, recipe list, like task list, whatever kind of list, I would say that you put yourself, taking care of yourself, you know, as number one. Um, I really don't believe that that happens enough. And oftentimes for an industry, hospitality, where we're taking care of others and, and servicing others and, and pour, we just, we end up pouring from empty cups. And that's why burnout is such a common topic, right? In our industry is that chefs don't prioritize themselves and they prioritize work um, to an extreme. And, and I understand why it's no judgment. I I've done it. I've burned out. I can't tell you how many times. Um, but what I learned from burning out and what I learned from doing that for so long is that you can't actually build a career on that, mm -hmm. you know, where you feel fulfilled, you can build a career, but you're not going to feel fulfilled and you're not going to be healthy. And when you're suffering and you're struggling and your mental and physical health are unstable because you're working, you're overworking so much, um, you're just continuing the same cycle of the, again, the influence of the brigade system and the 
not, you know, the lack of psychological safety and, and you're just continuing this like super toxic, harmful practice um, of depleting people. And so once I understood that and I made the connection of like how it's all interconnected, I really understood that it's so important for all of us, as, as uncomfortable as it may feel sometimes and as vulnerable as it requires you to be, that you really learn how to properly, you know, care for yourself in the same way that you would care for others. Thank you. Thanks very much for that. I'm glad you raised that. <laughs> it's very important to say again and again. Um, and one last question is about employers. What could you say is one thing that employers can do to support their staff and their well-being? So again, I, I have like so many things I would want to say here, but if I had to pick one, um, I think, I think there's, okay, so I'm, I'm going to be in that annoying guest that gives you two anyways. Um, so one I would say is that you have to role model. So you have to understand that you as a employer or owner operator have influence and that you're the one that sets the tone. So you can't just say that you want, you know, uh, psychological safety in the workplace or that you want people to have a better work-life balance or that you want people, you know, to take better care of themselves if you yourself are not doing that. So I would say for the employer, like number one, again, it's like almost the same advice I give the chef is like, you need to do you first. You cannot ask others to do something you are not doing for yourself. That is completely um, inappropriate on every level. And so I think it's really, really important that if you're expecting these things from your team and your staff, that you yourself are doing it. And it can then become normalized, right? It becomes normalized that like, oh, my boss is he does, you know, this for exercise. He takes water breaks. He takes actual breaks. He walks out and takes a 10 minute breather and comes back. Or she, um, you know, she goes to yoga and she meditates and she does all these things for herself and her mental and physical health or or she, you know, has other hobbies outside of her job. You know, she has other interests and she has other friends. Like, so that it's not just all work, 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 work. Because oftentimes what happens is you build these like work, you know, teams and these relationships and you're very bonded and that's awesome. But it's also important to have other aspects to your life as well. Like you said, work-life balance and there needs to be more components. Um, and... And so I would encourage anyone that's, you know, in that kind of authoritative level of that position to understand that they have influence that can then carry down to everyone else. Because when you see your boss normalizing these things, um, you, you, again, it's like the vulnerability thing I said earlier, like you feel the permission is given to you as well. Um, and the second thing I would add is that it is extremely important to acknowledge verbally and in writing, um, you know, that, that we all have mental health and that, you know, mental health is not something that is a bad thing. It's, it's, it's a completely neutral thing. So like you have mental health, I have mental health. Our mental health can move from one state to the next, it's fluid. So, you know, today I might be doing really well and I might be feeling great and stable. And then tomorrow I might wake up and feel not so great and maybe, you know, have symptoms of depression or have an anxiety attack or something might happen where I feel different and it feels a little less stable. But regardless, everyone has mental health. So I think it's really important. The second thing I would say to um, start to move us forward as an industry you know, is to acknowledge that and, and to verbal, like verbally say it in a regular, you know, way. Um, and, and then what that does is it normalizes it for everyone else. And it becomes just, you know, a regular part of life because it is a regular part of life for anyone. Um, and I think for too long, we just 
haven't done that. You know, we've been pretending like we don't have mental health and, and it's caused so much harm for so many people. Thank you. And there's something that I see that's linking both your answers. It's like, what a nice bridge to connect, well, start conversations. If you're an employer, as an employer, you can talk to your team about their interests and what a way to start seeing somebody beyond the chef jacket that they wear or the service uniform that they wear. It's such an easy way to sort of open up the, open up, well, build a bridge, I want to say. <laughs> build a bridge. Yes, well. yes. You can open up conversations for around mental health and how everyone's feeling and just it's simple, I think. Yeah, like it doesn't have to be about people's personal lives. I think there's a big misconception sometimes. People get confused and they think like, well, I don't want to talk about my personal life. It's like, of course not. You absolutely don't have to, you know, but, you know, asking someone how they're doing and creating an environment where someone could say like, I'm not having a great day um, is kind of cool because then what happens is that, you know, you share with me whatever you feel comfortable sharing and maybe you share nothing at all. Maybe that's all you say. Like, I'm just like, I'm not feeling great today. But what is so amazing is that for the rest of our service working together, I now have that piece of information that, you know, Isha isn't feeling that well today. So I'm going to help out more or I'm going to have more empathy or I'm going to offer maybe to do one of your tasks for you, you know, um, and it's none of my business why you feel that way, you know, and it's none of my business as to like what led you to feel that way. But I think it is my business to try to support you as my teammate. Thank you. Thanks very much. And I would like to ask where the Love Letters to the Chefs community members can find out about Nine to Five, uh, not Nine to Five, and your courses and trainings. Oh, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so we have a website, www.not9to5.org. And the nine and the five are numbers. They're not spelt. Um, and on Instagram as well, at not9to5 underscore. Um, and our, yeah, the new version of our course is coming out in the next two months in the spring. So we had put it out late 2020. We put it out for free for a few months. It was like the first iteration. And the idea is like a beta product, kind of like we put it out to gather feedback. So we had like 700 hospitality workers go through it. And now we're kind of collecting all of that feedback and going through all the survey um, responses that we got and revising it. And so putting out the new version this spring and you will be able to access it from our Instagram or our website. Thank you. I'll put the links to both below this video. Thank you. Thank you, Haswell. Thank you very much for being with your time to share so many, so many wonderful results with us. Oh, no. Thank you for your time and for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for watching.